point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. For more information, visit Sennheiser.com slash XSWD. MKE 600 is a shotgun microphone ideal for professional video camera applications. Yeah. Maximal rejection of ambient side noises thanks to pronounced directivity. And because the MKE 600 has a very good suppression of structure borne noise, it makes one of the most versatile all round shotgun microphones on the market. The new Super 35 sensor that Canon have introduced with the C300 Mark III is quite a big step up from other S35 sensors that they have created before. From the body and the flexibility that gives us in terms of the expansion packs and the interchangeable mount, to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before, I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. From a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers.
Hello and welcome to Pro AV Live. We're here joined by Phil from Bird Dog. Hello, Phil. How are you today? Hi, Carl. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? I am all right. So we are here to talk about Bird Dog PTZ cameras. Um, PTZ cameras are something that has been of a hot topic recently in the last couple of months for obvious reasons. The Effectively, the entire point of them is that they are operatorless um, cameras. You know, they can pan, tilt, and zoom by themselves. Now, obviously, they're used in a whole bunch of different. It's not just to try and get rid of camera operators. They are um, used for all sorts of different nuanced reasons. But I think that has been the reason why we've been talking about them to customers a lot recently. So there's a, been a lot of interest, and presumably, you've been seeing the same thing, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. The The global demand for PTZ cameras has really just gone through the roof over the last six, seven months, obviously, as you say, with the need to reduce the number of people on sets and people re working remotely from home via Skype and Zoom and some of the other sort of meeting platforms. Yeah, we've seen a huge increase in demand for, uh, for PTZ cameras and for then NDI uh, on the back of that as well to be that sort of mechanism and protocol for delivering the images over networks and to various other places. Absolutely. Um, so we've got a few people watching this right now live. Um, and so I do want this to be a two-way conversation. I don't want this to just be us going through some PowerPoint slides and talking to each other for half an hour and then calling the stream. Um, so please do talk back in the YouTube chat or on Facebook. Um, one thing that would be really interesting to get us all started is let us know what sort of experience level you've got with PTZ cameras because we talk to a whole variety of customers because that increase in demand has gone, has increased massively in the last couple of months. We're talking to a lot of people that are very, very new to the world of PTZ cameras, much like myself. I'm also very new to all of this. Um, I imagine, Phil, you've got a little bit more experience in this than I have. <laughs> um, but certainly historically, whenever we would talk to a customer about PTZ cameras, they're very familiar with them. They've been in the industry for quite a long time. They've been working with cameras like this for a long time. They know all about them. Whereas the we've seen a lot more new people right now. So yeah, the people watching, I would be very curious to see um, what sort of experience levels have we got watching us today. So let, let us know, are you, are you brand new? Have you never touched a PTZ before in your life? Are you just trying to get your grips or you're looking at investing in something for the first time and you're really trying to weigh up the options between different PTZ brands? Or are you something who's been using PTZs for a good long time but has never really looked at bird dogs before? Or maybe you're an expert in bird dogs and you've been using them for years and years and years. Let us know. Very has already popped up saying he's got no direct experience with PTZ cameras, currently trying to decide if you go with two PTZ cameras or Blackmagic 6K controlled by the ATEM switcher. Fantastic. That is exactly the sort of information I am after. Um, and as to which one you go, really, it depends how important that PTZ part of it is for you. Because a like a Pocket 6K, for example, though it's a great camera with a lovely sensor, um, and they have done some really cool stuff over control over HDMI, you're never going to be able to pan and tilt and zoom it without investing in much bigger things around it. Whereas little cameras like this one, for example, this bird dog here, can pan, tilt, and zoom all around by itself. So it depends what your needs are going to be. Would you add anything to that, Phil? No, I think you summed it up very well there. Um, yeah, a, a PTZ cameras obviously can do a lot of things that you can't do with a traditional star broadcast camera, whether it's a, a Blackmagic unit, a, a Canon, a Sony. Um, it just gives you the ability to do different things and have that sort of greater degree of control over the actual image and what you're looking at remotely in the same building over you know a thousand miles two thousand miles depending on what protocol you're using for the control um obviously we spoke about bird dog clouds i think last time i was on and with clouds you can do a complete remote production from ten thousand miles away connecting via srt Absolutely. to p200 cameras p100 any of our bird dog cameras so yeah it just depends you on this one on the desk right next to me Absolutely, yeah. It just depends, it just depends on your workflow and how much uh, how much you need to have the ability to uh, just have that control on the camera. He mentions he's working for a church, which I think is a very common um, 
sort of yeah. um, use case for people that are trying to get into PTZs right now um, we, with anything that is a events-based company. And of course, churches really at their heart are events-based. You're getting a group of people together in person for something. It is effectively a regular event. Um, and things like PTZs and live streaming is just becoming such a fantastic tool for places like that to be able to carry on doing what they do in this new world we all find ourselves in. Um, and of course, the, the big thing I'm talking about with lots of customers is when, if you're investing in Kit right now for that, just to try and overcome some of the COVID things, making sure that it's Kit that then works for you in the future, because all of this is useful stuff. All of this is, is something that is of a huge amount of value to a company, even under normal circumstances. Take a church, for example, being able to expand beyond just the, say, 100 people that you can actually fit into that church to a YouTube audience or a Facebook audience, and even with a, even a private group on Facebook, is very, very valuable and powerful um, moving forward. Um, okay, let's, let's crack on with some of these... Um, slides and introduce some people to bird dog shall we welcome to the future there you go what a <laughs> line that is yeah that was uh, that was Eamon, our uh, on the cmo and one of the co-founders he, he's great with taglines so uh, that was one of his <laughs> well it makes sense i mean ndi is a technology and ndi is really the the root of your company is that fair to say it's a company that's born out of ndi becoming a thing yeah absolutely yeah the, the, the dog as a company was born um at the same time that ndi was announced to the world um so that's around about four and a half years ago um it took took a while to design um and bring the, the first product to to market um but most of that was down to not not having done it before and also um sort of the different nuances of actually programming fpga chips and then building those into sure. products um so that then you've actually got something that can be updated and can be move forward with the protocol as it's advanced so yeah so we so yeah four and a half years um we're we're all about ndi every every single one of our products is based around ndi um and to note it's only full ndi at the moment we don't have any products that um have ndi hx capability um that's true of our cameras and encoders that's a very common thing with ptz because nearly every ptz when it or even camera when it says it has ndi support they are talking about ndi hx and for people that aren't yeah. familiar with that there are two flavors of ndi the full-blown ndi um and then ndi hx which is a lighter more compressed version of it which is great for fitting more streams onto a bandwidth but does come at a quality loss and if anything more importantly a latency loss i mean can you remember what the latency difference is phil it depends uh, depends on the camera um but anything from three to four frames um upwards on hx and three to four frames is on a good ndi hx camera um there's been some really bad examples of uh, the latency uh with with hx in some uh, cameras that we've seen um so yeah it just does depend i mean with full ndi coming out of one of our cameras you're looking at a frame of latency for the uh, iframe yeah. 120 meg um obviously talking hd uh, flavor of ndi there so so yeah. less latency higher quality um yeah. it's a it's a real win as long as you're not trying to fit more things onto a smaller um, bandwidth network absolutely right let's go through that range yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, let's start. So, first one um, is our P4K camera. So this is just um, just started to ship now. Um, we announced it uh, in September last year at uh, IBC and won a Best of Show award for it. Um, so as you'll see as we go through the slides, all of our cameras are based on Sony sensors, Sony Sony imaging modules. Um, so we have a really good uh, range of sensors that we use, the optics and the zoom technology, the autofocus, the glass, everything comes from, from a Sony background. Um, so we're really taking Sony, um, Sony 
so many units and building them into our own um, cameras. So P4K is no different. We use a one inch Sony um, Exmor R CMOS sensor. Um, we have a 12 times optical zoom, which has the Sony SRZ um, zoom technology built into it. It's a Zeiss uh, Vario uh, Sonar T lens. Um, so it's a really good quality um, camera. This is our flagship camera. So this is the most expensive mm -hmm. unit that we actually uh, sell at the moment. And it uses the same guts um, as the Sony BRC X1000. Um, so the sensor and the imaging module and everything is the same that the Sony use in their camera. Um, so I think the BRC 1000 has been around now for probably about 12 to 18 months. So that's a known camera. The sensor performs really well. Um, and we had some great feedback on this camera. Um, just noticed that this uh, this is actually wrong. It's not a 30 times optical zoom. Unfortunately, it is only a 12 times zoom. <laughs> I slapped my times. wrist for not <laughs> noticing that earlier. Um, because it's a 4K camera. It does say 12 times further up. <laughs> it does, yeah. And then I've, I've slotted the other one in. It's copying and pasting at its worst for you. Um, so this camera does draw a little bit more power. It's doing 4K, so it is a PoE++. Um, so it does just need a little bit more power than all of our other cameras. Um, so there are ways of doing that. There aren't that many PoE++ um, switch units around at the moment, but uh, it runs on the mains and you could use a, uh, a PoE injector, yeah. something like the Ubiquiti or something, because that would work fine. Yeah, I think most customers that we talk to about the P4KO, either plugging it into mains, which is probably the most common, or using something <clears> like the yeah. injector you just mentioned, which is a great little way of doing it. Um, cause POE plus plus obviously is intensive on the switch side of things. And the way I like to think about ranges like this is that you've almost got a sliding scale between being high quality and being very convenient. And so it's how yeah. far do you want, like, yes, the image quality on the P4K is incredible, but it is, um, a low, uh, less of a zoom range and it's more thirsty on the power, um, yeah. versus say the P200, which is a huge zoom range. Um, and sips power to just normal POE. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So, this is the flagship one, the main 4K camera, and with a one inch sensor as well. That's a huge sensor for a PTZ camera. I mean, sure, it's not yeah. Super 35 like we're used to in the cinema sort of world, but um, for things like low light for churches and all the rest of it, that is a fantastic um, sized sensor. Yeah, it's yeah. Obviously, it's quite an expensive uh, PTZ unit to put into a church, sure. but we have we have seen them going in. We have we have a number of installs that are going to be going ahead for for churches with this camera. Um, we've got a number of theatres that are looking at it as well. Um, obviously, the lighting in a theatre is mm -hmm. quite low. Um, so yeah, and some cruise yep. ships for, again, but that's based on on the theatres within the cruise ships. Um, and also a lot of um, interest from studio, uh, more traditional sort of broadcast studio applications um, as well. Um, has it has triple output on this as well. So we have SDI and HDMI as well as NDI. So um, I think sometimes people do forget that our cameras have those connectivity as well. Um, yeah. we're obviously, we're known for NDI, so that's Cat, Cat 6 cable, Cat 5 cable coming out the back. But um, yeah. equally, we have SDI and HDMI connectivity, so they work really well in a traditional um, uh, workflow as well. Um, so going into Blackmagic Switch, into an AJA matrix or something as well. So um, yeah, we, we can do that as well. And the output can be mixed between NDI and the baseband video coming on SDI as well. So you can have different frame rates coming out of, of, of both of them at the same time if you uh, wanted. That's quite cool. And we do have some sure. customers that are using that. Yeah, I can't think of any reason that you would want to do that off the top of my head. There must be some. You, you... It was, I think it was mainly for monitoring um, and a couple of purposes. It was a bit, of, it was, yeah, it was a little bit niche um, what they were using it for, but it, it is possible to do it. So uh, it's, it's good um, that it's got enough processing grunt to do that. Yeah. So it has a smaller sibling, if you like, but this is the other 4K option that you guys do. It is. So the P400, this has now just started um, shipping as well. So this is a smaller sensor um, than the uh, P4K. Uh, so this is a one and two fifth inch sensor. Again, it's a Sony sensor, Sony imaging module, um, 20 times zoom on this. So not, not as long as the P200. Um, it's PoE++ power again. 
just to game because it's a 4K unit, so it's doing a lot more processing in there. We have the same triple outputs, NDI, SDI, um, HDMI. Uh, this is actually this camera is actually the same footprint almost as the uh, P200, um, so it's still mm, quite, it's quite it's a compact nice little camera. Yeah, the only difference is just the um, the the heat fins that stick out on the back on the P400. They're just slightly more pronounced, but uh, not a huge difference at all. Okay. Um, so the, good, the nice thing about the both the P400 and the P4K is that uh, we have uh, the ability to give the camera operators and, and customers the ability to actually dial in, um, actually mess around with the color quite considerably with these colors. So they have access, access to the full color matrix on these cameras. Um, at the moment, that has to be done via the on-screen display, but we do have um, version two of our cam control software coming out shortly. That will then enable you to do that in software rather than using the uh, the sort of IR remotes and doing it that way. We have just had a um, comment from Shem who says, any update for that cam control app, good for adjusting the cameras, but the current version, he says, is quite buggy. Um, so I guess version two would fix that. Version two will fix that. Yeah, absolutely. It's something we've been working on for a while. Um, so that is due to come out very shortly as well. Very cool. Okay, so that's those are the two 4K options. Now, most people don't live stream in 4K. Currently, we do get, we do have quite a few customers that are wanting to um, push towards 4K. But unlike, say, the the more traditional capture audience that we that we service. Um, who are nearly always filming in 4K nowadays. In the streaming world, yeah. most people are still in 1080p because of bandwidth, um, but with 4K moving towards us the future. So the two 1080p cameras that you do are the P200 and the P100. Yes, yeah, so the P100 is is our little baby um, entry-level camera. Again, it's, it's a Sony sensor. Um, it's still uh, one frame of latency coming out. Um, this uh, this camera though interestingly has um, quad outputs. So we have USB, NDI, SDI, and HDMI. So with the USB output, you can use it as a, as a webcam. Um, so you can put it into mm. webcam mode. So you could plug that directly into your laptop and then use it in conjunction with Zoom or Teams or Skype or any of the um, sort of meeting applications out there that have NDI enabled um, and albeit a very expensive um, webcam at that point, it, it does look sure. very nice and you can certainly see the difference in quality. We had a number of these that uh, were involved with um, Zoomtopia um, last week um, being used mm -hmm. by various different people um, when they were doing their talks and streaming. Um, so this, this one's an interesting little camera. It's quite small. It is limited to only a 10 times um, optical zoom though, unfortunately, but for sitting on a, on a table in a boardroom or in a sort of small studio or an office space um, where you don't need that sort of really big sort of zoom uh, length, it works really well. And so it's a really good little camera for the money. Um, and in terms of sensor, is it a similar sensor to the C200 or is it um, a slightly smaller one? It's a slightly different sensor to the uh, P200. Um, similar size, but it, it is a different sensor. Gotcha. Uh, obviously, when, when you start looking at sensors, there's quite a big jump between different sensors in terms of price, hence why this one is sort of priced at, at its price point. Makes sense. And then there's the P200, which has been, would you say this is the best selling one for you? It's certainly the one I think we've had the most conversations about. Yeah, the P P P200 now has been selling. It's been selling for all oh, 12 months or so, and it's been doing really well, particularly the last six months. Um, we have struggled to keep up with global demand. So for all those customers out there that have been waiting and are still waiting, I do apologize. Um, component issues, supply and chain uh, has been um, terrible over the last few months um, yeah. with regards to certain components that are required for some of our products. So we are seeing seeing a bit of a delay with stuff coming out, particularly with the PTZ keyboard, unfortunately. But the P200 has been selling really well. We're seeing it going into all kinds of different places for all kinds of different uses, um, educational house of worship, um, casinos, um, cruise ships, uh, even funeral, funeral, um, funeral parlors and different places yeah. like that. So yeah, all kinds I mean, of different workplaces for optical it. optical zoom just makes it so um flexible i mean you can't really yeah. get a bigger zoom than that on a ptz 
No, you can't. No, it is really good. There's some great pictures from a customer in America the other day where they'd mounted a P200 right at the back of their church. So sort of over mm. quite a distance, they were able to zoom the whole length of the the church and sort of focus in on a uh, a wooden um, sculpture of Jesus on the cross and the, the sort of detail level even over that sort of distance was was pretty pretty impressive. Oh, cool. I might be slightly biased, but it did look very good. <laughs> Just a little biased. So in terms of the range, P100, P200, P400, and P4K, where yeah. do you think each one sort of sits in terms of a customer base? I mean, are there sort of broad customer chunks that you can point towards each sort of one as a starting point? I mean, obviously, there'll always be crossover. Yeah, I mean... Yes and no. I mean, it's been surprising um, over the last few months to actually see where our cameras are actually being utilised and what they're being used for. Um, P200 is is the mainstay, um, and we see that being used for all kinds of corporate events, live streaming, and, and that sort of environment. But equally, we've now seen them being moved into to medical and other sort of vertical fields that we hadn't really considered ourselves um, to start with. Same with P100. Um, P100. Uh, for its price point, gives a really good picture, um, and is being, yeah, again, being used in all kinds of different places. So, I don't think I could point at any one particular sort of area that that is is leaning towards each of the cameras. Um, obviously, P4K and P400 are sort of fairly new to the market. People are still sort of feeling sure. their way, getting a look at them because obviously when you're spending p4k money on a camera you want to see the image coming out of it before you'll uh, make a decision which is yeah. understandable um well, so p4k really hits the people who are looking for the best possible image quality yeah. from a ptz absolutely but p400 is very well priced for a, for a 4k camera um sort of in its range but again people still want to see the image so i possibly think that in time the p400 will overtake the p200 in sales that's just mm -hmm. my guess i'm not sure that the guys in the office uh back in australia would agree with me but uh we have a little bet uh, side bet running on that one um but yeah no it's, it's just been surprising actually um over the last few months where our cameras are being used and, and what they're being used for it's very diverse talking of which we have a question come in from nick 1976 who says he's looking into ptz as a way of live streaming his photo shoots remote clients etc but he has no experience of either streaming or ptz let us know if you have any questions um on that nick um but for for, for that sort of thing you can it's quite easy with one of these, particularly like a little P100, which can be plugged directly into use it as webcam mode. And then just being able to swap between your displaying your screen to share your Lightroom or whatever with a client in the same way as I'm sharing this PowerPoint presentation. And then being able to have a PTZ next to that computer zoomed in towards your, your studio space so that you can, yeah. they can see the model, they can see the lighting and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, I think that there is definitely um, scope to use it. Is that the sort of thing you were thinking of, Nick? Let me know. Um, but while he comes back on that one, let's move on to the um, the A range rather than the P range. And these are a bit more yep. sort of um, specialist cameras, if you like. Um, yes. I mean, I, I guess it's just anything outdoors, right? Yeah, basically anything outdoors. So um, the, the A200s uses exactly the same sensor as the the p200 obviously the only difference is the housing um so the a200 looks a little bit like a security camera sort of sits in that sort of underslung position um uh it isn't obviously isn't a security camera by any means um but uh designed yeah just designed it would to be, be a very good security camera you'd be able be to see quite a lot from it you would yeah um <laughs> Yeah, it wouldn't be like the fuzzy images you see on sort of police camera exactly. action and stuff. But uh, <laughs> it is, it's designed to be mounted permanently outside. It's um, IP67 rated. Uh, it has nice. an operate decent operating temperature range of minus 40 to plus 60. Um, it's corrosion resistant. We have a windscreen wiper on there, which is very useful for uh, for use in mm. the UK, where we get lots of rain and sleet and horrible weather. Um, it has SDI and NDI outputs. Uh, this one does a full 360 degree spin as well. We have um, a slip ring mechanism okay. in there. 
Um, it's got a heater in the housing as well. So in those sort of lower temperatures uh, to stop the lens uh, from fogging and misting, that, that's in there to help. The only drawback on that is that it does require a little bit more power than the uh, sort of indoor cameras. So this one goes up to around about 67 watts. Um, we've got these being installed in all kinds of different places. Um, we've got them on the outside of uh, OB vans in the Middle East. Um, we've got them around sporting stadiums. There were a number of these that would have been at the Olympics um, if they'd have gone ahead, uh, the Winter Olympics. Perhaps for anything events-wise, outdoors, that you want to just be able to permanently rig around a racetrack or something like that, for example, or a festival, like sort of yeah. a music festival, and then yeah. not have to worry if it starts to rain and all the rest of it. Um, I, I can see that being absolutely fantastically useful. Even if it's only yeah, for crowd shots and then you're using more traditional cameras for the stage bits. Yeah, we we have done we have done some festivals and some sort of bigger things out in the States where um it's gone completely NDI. Um mm. there's a big a big festival called Canna Fest. I think it's changed its name, or it would have changed its name this year if it had gone ahead, but they solely went NDI for all of their uh, cameras. Um so they were using P200s, they were using sort of traditional Sony and Blackmagic cameras, but with studio um, NDI converters and minis on, their, their entire infrastructure was then run back to new tech TC1s, um, and they did, did the whole thing. So yeah, we're seeing, seeing them being used in those environments as well. Um, I think probably the, the most famous place we have a couple of A200s on is the front of the White House now as well. Well, that's pretty famous. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> really famous. It doesn't rain as quite as much as over here, though. No. <laughs> so, A300. Yeah. Bigger brother, right? <clears throat> much bigger. Um, this is quite a beast, actually, this camera. It weighs, uh, oh, off memory, around about 10 and a half kilos. So it's, it's pretty uh, It's pretty heavy. Um, but designed, obviously, to, to be that way. It's, it's a very rugged housing. The actual head on this is quite interesting because it's actually nitrogen filled. So there's no oxygen in there at all. So there's no possibility of ever fogging or clouding, misting at all. Um, we have a laser built into this as well. So for nighttime illumination, the laser will work um, up to uh, around 500 meters. Um, designed to be used in some really horrible environments. Um, we see them on top of um, news buildings, giving that sort of panoramic vista sort of shot over the rooftops that you see from time to time. We've got them on armoured vehicles, crowd control vehicles. Um, they really are very, very robust. Um, if mounted correctly, they're designed to withstand a Category 4 hurricane as well. So, yeah, Ooh. significant units. It looks like there's two cameras in there. Yeah, the the bottom is the camera and the top is the uh, the laser. Ah, gotcha. That's the nighttime laser. Yes, yeah, so that's the nighttime laser, which is why it also draws a little bit more power again than the the um, A two hundred because that laser array is in there and that leads a significant amount of uh, power to uh, to run it. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting unit. I think it, it is robust enough for me to attack it with a cricket bat, and the cricket bat would actually look. <laughs> so if that's what you're looking for in a PTZ, there we go. <laughs> Can hold up well in a wrestling match. <laughs> it hold up very well, yeah. So the PTZ keyboard is another thing that we... I, I reckon these go out with most of our orders um, for bird dog cameras. I think part of that has been because you've run a very successful bundle that has three cameras and this with it. Um, yeah. But these are fantastic for controlling it really quickly and simply. I mean, you don't need one of a, a physical controller for any of these PTZs. You can control them from free applications on any PC or anything like that. Um, or through TriCasters, if you're using TriCasters, they can actually control them directly in there. But having something physical for this um, does make your life much nicer, especially if you're working quickly or in teams. Um, but yeah, do you want to talk us through this, Phil? Yeah, so yeah, PTZ keyboard, um, it will control up to 255 cameras from one keyboard, which would be interesting to see an operator trying to do. I'd love to actually see that at some <laughs> point. Um, 
we have various different support in here. So we have NDI, Visca, Visca over IP, 422-232. So all of the sort of standard protocols for control and controlling PTZ cameras. Uh, probably one thing to note more than anything else is that we use Sony's version of Visca over IP. Um, there are a number of different variants of that control, um, which other manufacturers right. use. We obviously stick with the Sony one because of the, the sensors and everything that we have within our cameras. Gotcha. Um, so that's yep. probably one good thing to point out. Uh, it does work with other manufacturers' PTZ cameras. I must admit, we haven't tried it with everybody's. Um, but there are a lot of people using them with um, some new tech, PTZ Optics, and, and different uh, different manufacturers out there as well. Uh, it has all of the usual um, functionality you'd expect on a keyboard. So we have the sort of standard um, tele and wide sort of rocker switch. Uh, you can also do that by twisting the uh, the joystick as well. We have white balance, iris, control. Um, zoom, pan and tilt speed, focus speed, exposure buttons on here as well. We can do a number of camera presets. Um, so, yeah, it's a sort of fully featured PTZ keyboard in quite a small little package that's fairly robust as well. Okay. Um, as we move towards the end of these slides, by the way, everyone watching, if you, there are any questions that you've got, um, now is a great chance, time to be leaving them in the chat. Um, so that we've got time to go through them at the end. Um, but I mentioned that you don't have to use the physical keyboard to control cameras, um, and you can use software, which brings us on nicely to your cam control piece of software. Yeah, as I think Shem mentioned earlier, so we have um, cam control software. So this is a free to download piece of software from um, our website. Uh, designed specifically to work or to only work with our cameras. Um, I had a customer the other day um, uh, in the Far East who was quite upset that he downloaded it and it wouldn't work with a Panasonic camera. Um, but yeah, designed to work with our cameras. Um, unfortunately for all of those Mac users out there at the moment, it is only available on Windows platform. Um, we are looking at Mac integration with our software, um, but uh, the Mac fantastic. iOS is, yeah, is, yeah, is, is difficult um, and changes quite quickly. So we are going to look at that um, as we move forward. But Cam Control basically allows you um, access to control um, all of the PTZ cameras that are on your network that are from BirdDog. Uh, it has all of the standard um, functionality um, and menu that system that you would find within the web UI if you logged in um, via that way. Um, so you have um, uh, white balance, focus, um, color control, um, all those sort of standard camera settings. But we also have the ability to then control the camera a little bit as well. So we have um, in the middle, on the middle screen there, you can see the sort of PTZ controls. We can move the camera around. We can change the speed, the zoom, the focus. We can set presets. Uh, and with this as well, if you're using, say, 3P200, you could set the levels, color, and everything that you want on one camera and then copy those settings onto the other two cameras um, quite quickly. Just a couple of uh, clicks um, of, of a mouse. Uh, and then you can have three cameras that are sort of fully matched. Uh, so yeah, this, this is free. It's available now. We are working on the, the next version, um, which will be available very shortly, which will then allow you to have um, access via software to the uh, additional controls for the color, et cetera, within the P400 and the P4K. Very, very nice. OK, so Nick has come back on his photo shoot idea of BTZ. He says that's exactly how he'd use it, which is nice. Um, possible screen share and live feed of what's being shot while the clients view live. Can the PTZ also be controlled by the client? Yes, yes, it could. Um, at the moment, the only way we have to remotely control our cameras would be via our um, Bird or Cloud application, um, yep. which would then equally would be great for something that he would be looking for because you could actually send the, the feeds out there and there's WebRTC that anybody then can view on an iPad, an Android device, a laptop or something like that. But then um, they would also then be able to have the possibility of having another endpoint, which would then allow camera control from uh, an external location as well. So. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's worth pointing out that it is not a simple thing to do by any stretch of the imagination, controlling, um, basically joining something, giving someone remote access into an NDI network. That's something that um, 
is without bird or cloud anyway very very difficult to do um but obviously possible um bird or cloud is probably one of the easiest ways to do it um yeah. but even then it, you know it's not it's not a super simple user interface and all the rest of it it is a it is a feels like you're meddling with ip stuff um <laughs> and so um for some clients maybe not it's probably not as simple as i'd imagine he is thinking it is there but what what that is for everyone else out there listening um it is very good for is bringing in remote guests so what we could use in this studio for example and something that i would love to get up and running at some point is to have a actual ptz camera rather than a simple webcam because at the moment we're bringing phil in over a webcam via skype we could completely bypass that and just bring him in as a with a ptz camera using bird.cloud um to bring in full quality um and be able to control his camera and all the rest of it and settings um it would be a fantastic way to do it um so for things like that it is very very useful um for your particular situation nick um it might well work. It might well work. Um, well, in fact, it would work, but it, it just depends as to you as to whether or not that's simple enough for some of your clients. I'm just thinking back to some of the clients that I've had in the past. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he says, yep, yeah, he says the photographic world is solely Mac, and so not being on Mac would be yeah. um, a big deal for him, which makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. In terms of broadcast historically most broadcast and ndi has been run around um um windows i have found because obviously i'm running a mac max here and so this is being captured and fed in all of the mac tools are now available on mac rather than um being only on pc which they used to be um they're still lagging a little bit behind the pc world if you if you want to invest in equipment for ndi work i do recommend customers go with pc rather than mac um simply because it works much, much smoother um, for things like KVM, remote controlling, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, but the Mac ones do work very well. And so it is certainly possible with Mac, as I'm proving, I have a Mac right here, right now. Um, cool, yep, Shem is also chiming in. Everyone uses Mac in his events industry, so um, yeah. it would be, would be great. That would be lovely to see. Yeah, absolutely, we Everyone know there are a lot of yeah, one day we know there are a lot of Mac users out there, and I do get we do get asked that question quite a bit. Um, so it will be something yep. that we will, we will look at. Probably not until the early part of next year, um, as we have new sure. toys um, that we're looking at at the moment, uh, which will hopefully be exciting for uh, people. Very exciting stuff. Um, yeah. One thing I would, rather than ending on that note, um, I would point out that you absolutely do not need these camera control. Um, pieces of software like um, in order to work with it um, if you're using a NDI piece of software that works on Macs these will work with that so Wirecast, vMix all that sort of stuff and of course if you're using anything bigger like a TriCaster these will work absolutely fine um, you can view these with the NDI tools and, and even control them from the ones that are free for Mac so there are you can do an awful lot if you're in the Mac world with these cameras you don't need the cam control software that bird dog makes in order to have a working product which no. I think is an important note to end on there yeah absolutely we see people using um stream decks with obs um yep. we have a full um api library that's available for uh, for camera control um so there's lots of automation and different things that you can actually do to control the cameras it doesn't have to be the pdz keyboard it doesn't have to be a piece of software that's running on the device there's lots of things you can even control our cameras using an old xbox controller hooked up to your pc as well if you wanted to if you just have a single yeah. camera available so there's lots of things you can do there's, there's there's tons that people are using out there i, th I think this is why ndi has had this surge in popularity in the last few months um because it is the most flexible way of working with video over ip and this the ptz world most of it with traditional hdmi and sdi cables and all the rest of it it's quite limited in terms of you design an, an infrastructure and then that's what you then stick with. And then if you want yeah. to expand it, you can buy boxes and all the rest of it. By its very nature, video over IP and NDI 
are such a flexible way of working. You know, you can, if you've got 16 ports on your Switch and you need another camera, you can literally just take one of these, plug it in, and it will pop up on your system. And every single thing that is connected into that system, whether it's the TriCaster over there, the PC that's over here, PC downstairs, if it's connected to the same network, will be able to see that. You don't have to run specific SDI cables to all the places that this needs to be. So yeah. for changing your setup and being flexible, NDI is fantastic. Um, and yeah, definitely. For, for installation purposes as well, I mean, uh, if people know yeah. that your your P200 that you have on your desk there has one cable plugged into it, so just a single Cat5 yeah. or Cat6 cable, that's running yeah. power, that's running audio, it's running video, it's running control. Everything is just down that one cable, so you don't have to have it plugged into the, a mains port or have it near a local mains port. It doesn't have yeah. to have an SDI cable and then a control cable running to it. It's literally just one cable um, to do everything down. So yeah, for, for setups where you're going in to do a live stream, it's really easy just to plug one cable in, plug that into your switch um, and set up. And it, likewise, House of Worship have really liked the idea of NDI because of that, because you know, in a church, you don't have power, outlet, power outlets everywhere. And running one cable then isn't as bad, doesn't uh, sort of affect the, the aesthetics of the church. Um, and doesn't sort of impact on, on on the church itself. It's just a single, very lightweight, small cable that then just has to be run to the cameras. So yeah, it, it makes makes installation and makes setup so much easier and quicker. Um, and that that's true of all NDI products. So all of our products literally carry all of that control, information, and data just along one cable. Absolutely. It is so convenient. I mean, there's a whole bunch of ports on the back of this one here that I'm not even using. I'm just using one cable. Yeah, no, absolutely. They are there if you want to use them. But with NDI, the beauty is you don't need to. You don't have to. And I think the the other thing that I just wanted to end on was a bit of a demo of the other one that I've got in front of me, because I think the image quality is actually better than a lot of people would expect. So for these streams, I normally use the camera that's next to it, which is my C300 Mark II, um, which is plugged into a new tech Spark, into NDI, into our TriCaster, and looks great. It's a super 35 millimeter camera, obviously, um, and so the background's nice and out of focus. But this is now the P200, which we plugged in there. And so it's the P200. It's the middle of the lineup for Bird Dog. It's nothing particularly fancy in terms of image quality. This is what I would normally refer to as the average PTZ sort of image quality. And it's perfectly good enough for a lot of situations like this, especially anything where you actually want the deeper depth of field. And then the P4K, I'm very, very much looking forward to that. Um, yeah, Dan's actually just cut over to this one so that we can move this one about a little bit. But yeah, he's just zooming in on the camera there to show you. That is the setup that's in front of me. P200 um, there on the tripod and behind that auto cue is the C300 Mark II next to one another. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Um, if you have any more questions at all or you want any advice and help um, buying the equipment, obviously, but also just advice as to which things to pick and how to set it up and which route to go down, please do get in touch with us here at ProEV and talk to our sales team and us here at the tech team. And we can help guide you through this new world of PTZ. Uh, since I imagine most of the people watching this from the looks of things are fairly new, which is great. It's so exciting that products like this are going into a much wider market nowadays. But yeah, thank you so much for joining me, Phil. Hey, no problem at all. It's a pleasure. Cool. So if you've got any noise, it makes one of the most versatile all-round shotgun microphones on the market. The new Super 35 sensor that Canon have introduced with the C300 Mark III is quite a big step up from other S35 sensors that they have created before. From the body and the flexibility that gives us in terms of the expansion packs and the interchangeable mount to the sensor with its increased dynamic range for tackling scenes that possibly we couldn't have tackled or captured faithfully before. I can get more out of this camera. My money goes further. It's as simple as that from a business standpoint. 
from a creative point of view, it's unquestionably unlocking more creative avenues for us as filmmakers. Mm -hmm.